If everyone is be seated, and everyone pretty much is, we'll get started. Thanks for coming, everybody. Uh, we have a special guest tonight, Don Hall, that's here to speak about his uh, 50 years as a John Deere mechanic. 51, let's get 51. <laughs> and I'm going to begin with an article that was written 12, 13 years ago in uh, Country Folks Magazine. Uh, and this is by a local person, Phoebe Hall, and this is what she uh, had to say. 50 years working. How many people do you know that have worked at the same job for 50 years? Oh, there are a few, but almost everyone we know is ready to retire as soon as they can. But we know we know a person that can't retire because the farmers he works for won't let him. He's highly requested and in a big demand by many farmers to do their repair work. Some have let it be known that he has a job waiting for him after retirement. It's remarkable he never forgets you, nor leaves you in a pickle. Always willing to do your job and do it right. I think he has worked on every kind of equipment that is out there, including all the up-to-date, complicated machines. His phone is ringing constantly with calls from farmers trying to get on his agenda. When we asked him when he was retiring, he smiled and said, they won't let me. Some of the farms that he services are on the fourth generation going back to the early 60s. When asked what he would do differently if he had to do it all over again, his reply was, I've always been too busy to think about it. I just did what I had to do to get the job done. He'll turn 70 next year and has worked at John Deere dealership since early 62. He was originally at Carstens until 67 when Perry's bought him out. He was still working there in 2001 when they sold to Goodrich, uh, who sold out to ZM later. Today, is, he is one of the main reasons. As the roaming service and go-to guy, that John Deere still has a presence here. As a youngster, he was required on a daily basis to do, help do chores on his parents' dairy farm before and after school. However, his real love was always the farm equipment on the farm. And interestingly, all these years, the full-time <coughs> sideline, he's continued to farm, plus cut and burn wood to heat his residence in the greenhouse. He stated recently that the 4020 will always be a, a classic, but he still loves the old two cylinders. DH, it has been known, uh, Don Hall said, it, is, it has been a pleasure getting to know you all these 50 years, and we hope you'll be around another 50. And that was by Phoebe Hall. So, and then this is just a little something uh, that his family wrote up. Don's been a long time, Don, John Deere mechanic, worked for. Carson Implement, C.J. Perry, Goodrich Farm Supply, and then Z&M. Also worked for almost every farmer in Niagara County, as well as many in Orleans, Tennessee, and Erie. And uh, his cousin, Gene, also has an added uh, tidbit here, thinks he's the oldest li lifetime resident living on Beaton Road at this time. So, I uh, just have one announcement here for ourselves. Uh, next, for the Historical Society, next month's program is the Monday after uh, Thanksgiving, and that's going to be on disaster preparedness. And, uh, it's going to be by, put on by the Division of Homeland Security and Emergency Services. It's a course, a course presentation. It'll prepare residents to have the tools and resources available to prepare for any type of disaster. Uh, respond according to and recover quickly to disaster conditions. So we're not sure who, who's going to be the presenter, but that's the 28th of November. So with that, I'll let uh, John, uh, Don have the floor. Thanks, Frank. Yes. Well, it's an honor to be here tonight, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Frank, I'm going to see me way back in the spring. I was planting seeds in the greenhouse one day and he stopped in. Wanted to know if I'd do this. I said, yeah, I'll do that. So. Uh, with all those years working for a lot of you people, uh, there'd be no way we could tell you the whole story here tonight or tomorrow night or the next two months. It would probably take a year or two. <laughs> so I'd done a presentation at the True Summer Club two years ago at Alexander, and we went for two and a half hours that night, and we didn't touch the tip of the iceberg, really. So they say someday I'm coming back through in the second edition. So what I've got here is a lot of the highlights. and. Uh, some names I have mentioned, some I have not. Uh, there's a lot of stories I probably will not tell. Some stories are better not told uh, after they happen. 
But uh, there's a few things that got some clues there. You guys will figure out who I'm talking about. But, and there's other places that I've used names. So, and uh, if you have questions as we go along, uh, just call them out. And uh, I'd also like to let you know that uh, I'm in the music business as well. This year we have a special bluegrass and comedy show on hand dinner coming up down to Johnson's Creek on November 5th. And this is $15 a person. That is quite a deal. A hand dinner with all your fixings and desserts and beverages and two bands. The Creek Band out of Buffalo and our own band, Joe Slade, Creekside Classic Company. And that's old company, not the stuff they play nowadays. We learned in a show last year that they're playing rap now on the Grand Ole Opry. And the guy that we listened to said, you know what you get when you mix country music with rap? You get crack. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you're listening to nowadays on WYRK. So anyway, uh, we're going to pass the small one around here. You guys can all look at it. If you're interested in tickets, Don, would you start that passing around? Okay. See me after the show or give me a call. Uh, we're trying to get uh, some idea how many people we're going to have. So then I'm going to say this. I got in trouble Saturday night saying it, but we can find out how many pigs we've got to kill to feed everybody. I said that to some lady Saturday night, and she gave me a look like you wouldn't believe. I mean, she, she's figured out hams come out of the back of the grocery store. That they're not walking around. So you got to be careful nowadays. It's politically correct stuff. It's my idea is for the birds. But, uh, okay. So keep that in mind. Once a month we do a company show at the same location, Johnson's Creek Community Fellowship Church. Music is from 6 until 9. We feed everybody at 7.30. There is no charge. There is a donation bucket for food only, free will offering. And this past Saturday night we had pizza and wings, macaroni and potato salad, uh, desserts and night. Gee, what else we have? Spanish rice. Spanish rice. Spanish rice. Spanish rice. Nobody else, nobody comes home hungry, guaranteed. So is that the third Saturday each month, Don? It's uh, generally around the middle of the month. It's not always the same Saturday. But uh, we always try to be in the Lockport paper and in the night and day magazine. Uh, we're on Lockport Cable TV. We're uh, uh, Amherst B, uh, the Tavia Daily News, Amherst, not Amherst. Uh, the Akron Corpu Penny Saver and the Alden Penny Saver. And then over east, we're in the uh, Lake Country Penny Saver over there. Plus, on Facebook. So, and then I call. I'll make 65 to 80 phone calls. <coughs> you know, I bug them all the time. Where else can you go on a Saturday night where you don't really have to pay anything or very much? And you're listening to some good old country music. We've got two new ladies. The one lady plays a banjo and she does a great job. She does a banjo, a mandolin, and a guitar. And the other lady plays a keyboard. They were the opening act for our show this time around. And they're now members of our church, so they'll be a, they'll be a regular thing at all of our shows. Our, uh, our band consists of Joe Slay. He's our pastor. He, he's the lead singer, plays guitar, mandolin, banjo. His wife plays bass guitar, sings. And we have Dave Nolan. He sings as a voice like Jim Reeves, very smooth, and his wife sings also. And then we'll have other guests to get up. Sometimes we get some really good talent out of the audience. Jerry Moore, some of you may recognize that name. He's 83 years old now. Still singing, still writing songs, making CDs. And uh, he's put a little group together. He's there every month. So, uh, in fact, Saturday night, they go back and they play songs from the uh, 40s and 50s. Okay, enough of my uh, commercials. I started back at Carson's full-time in the spring of 1962, part-time a little bit before that. Carson's had everybody in the neighborhood working there. When he took that business over, anybody that walked through the door, <coughs> Sue's dad, he worked there, I remember that. Gene's dad worked there. If you walked in the door and you'd say, what are you doing today? And <laughs> you weren't doing anything, put you to work. It could be anything, but uh, they were just taking over the business and they were going crazy. Uh, starting pay was $2 an hour when I got going there. No health care and no vacation. That's the way things were back there. Uh, you didn't, we were too busy. You didn't have time to get sick anyway. So we, 
but he didn't worry about that. Uh, Arnold Carson, he had bought up really well. He had the John Deere dealership on that corner. Uh, it had it burned to the ground, so Carson took it over. And that used to be the uh, Stockwell and Blacklock dealership years ago, International Harvester McCormick Deere from the 1800s. Well, there was one barn left on the property, and Carson uh, got that, and they added a concrete block addition, and that was their parts room and the sales. And uh, so, old Arnold Carson, he was a wheeler dealer, and he soon gained a thriving business. Uh, you guys are like this. You remember, you remember too. He invaded the international country up around Sanborn and Burkholz <laughs> and Shawnee. And, uh, and he really had a thriving business going. Uh, we got a lot of business on the Indian Reservation. Quite a few of those guys were farmers. And I started off being a mechanics helper. And my mentors were Howard Seafelt. Any of you people from all the Wilson area you might remember some of the seatbelts. And uh, Wayne Robinson, he's still alive, he was over in Lupin. And Roger Bowerman, he has since deceased. Uh, the jobs that I had were washing parts and a bucket of gasoline. That's hardly OSHA approved nowadays. <laughs> you can't do that no more. Uh, it worked great, it was the best parts cleaner that I had going. Uh, changing all kinds of tires, front and rear tires on tractors, mountain tires on the machinery, loading tires with calcium, installing weights on tractors, assembling new equipment, touching up paint. Wayne taught me to weld with a big old Westinghouse buzz box. And we had two kinds of weld rod back then, nickel for cast iron and 13 for everything else. And after a few years, I became a better welder than my teacher, Wayne. And he always took a little burn to that. <laughs> that I actually got to be better than he was. Uh, I learned a, a real hard lesson early on. Why not to wear engineer boots at work? One day I was torching a bearing out in the shaft on a customer's pickup truck tailgate. And of course your pant legs all sit up on top of a boot and a big chunk of a hot, red hot bearing went right down the side of the boot, right down to the ankle bone. And I still got a little depression there from that. So next day I went to Lockport, bought a brand new pair of lace-up tight work shoes, threw those boots away, and uh, never worn any since. So learned my lesson. And then, years later, I learned that we were welding things that we were not supposed to be able to do with the welder we had and the rods we used. But we learned, you know, if you learn how to do it with the stuff that's not supposed to work, you get to be pretty good. But we could do vertical and upside down. And we found out from good welders you have to have a, an AC-DC welder for that. Heaven forbid you take an old buzz box and do stuff like that. Nobody told us, so we just <laughs> done it anyway. Ah, our shop at that time, that old barn, only had eight foot ceilings. So any tractor of almost any size that wanted to put inside there, they'd take the muffers off and the air stacks off. Now, I got married on September 30th, 1962. We had a very long honeymoon. The next morning I had to go back to work. We got married on a Monday night and back to work Tuesday morning. That afternoon I got my new wedding ring. I'm pulling on a wrench. So they, uh, Howard and Wayne, they stuck my finger in a vise, squeezed it back around, and got it off my finger. And I haven't worn a wedding ring since. I do wear a watch, but I'll take that off if you're welding a torch into that. That picks up stuff too and you can hurt you or you can get caught on things. So, uh, one of the dirtiest jobs that we always had to do was steam cleaning tractors and new dairy farmers with the manure spreaders. Of course, the new, the new workers, the low men on the totem pole, they always got to steam clean the manure spreaders. You know, if you were there a while, you didn't, get to, you didn't have to do that. Uh, Repairing one of our sweaters, that was a fun job. Uh, being a new employee, we got to do a lot of picking up and delivering. You wouldn't believe the things that we towed with a pickup truck. The heavier loads were all with a tow pet truck. I started doing service calls on the road as well. One of the pitfalls of working at the customer's place was getting along with the critters. Mean dogs, geese, ducks, turkeys, and even cats. Now, Dwayne Langenbrook is sitting here tonight, and uh, 
he, you had a duck I found out later was the boss, he went over to Turkey. But I had a turkey to come on and attack me because I'm hammering. And I found out that he didn't like noise. You were building pole barns at that same time, and every time them guys run the skill saw, that turkey went running over there. And I didn't realize when their gullet changes color, they're mad. And Dorothy's wanted, she wanted to know what I was doing to the turkey. I said, I'm not doing anything to it. And uh, Bert Martin, he had a cat over there on this road that was the absolute boss. That was the boss over the dogs and all the other cats and people. We went there for a barn party one night and we built a new shop. And I had to take and show my wife that. This cat was the scrawniest looking thing and his hair stuck straight out like porcupine quills. And he got within 10 feet of a <laughs> So those are the kind of things that we had to, uh, to work with. Now, over the years, I've helped chase cows, pigs, sheep, goats, and horses that got loose. No extra charge for that. We were there, so we helped. You know? uh, at Brown's over on Cooper Road here in New Plain, they had one goose that wouldn't leave me alone when they go there to work on the track. If you turn your back, he, he tried to attack you. If you look him in the eye, he'd back off and keep his distance. But uh, we, could, we got along with him, just had to keep, you couldn't work the city, you had to keep looking at him. So. Uh, we had customers over west here, on the, over the place on Swan Road, Bob and Beth Jordan. They had a pair of beasts. One was a pet that loved to be petted or held. While doing that, the other one would come up and bite you in the back of the lake. <laughs> Always. <laughs> uh, another place we had beast problems was Paul Black, down on Osmond Road. I went there one day, got there at noon, got out of my truck, and this guy come over there, running right at me, wings off, off and away. I reached out my hand and got him around the neck and held him up. And he was hollering and squawking and flapping his wings. And Paul ran out of the house and said, hey, what are you doing to my goose? I says, we're just getting a little understanding here between each other. He says, put him in a pen, away and go out and get to work. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's trouble I had looking here. See, I'm going to get ahead of my story a little bit here. Uh, da, 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 see here. Okay, I've already talked about the turkey there, Lane and Uh Adrian Frerichs. I was there one day working on a piece of equipment, and doors are open on my truck as always. You leave your doors open, the <coughs> wrenches off. Put everything away when I got ready to leave that day, and there was a cat inside my truck. I didn't think too much of that. I just threw him off. Closed the doors, went down the road. When it come to be noontime, I went to get my lunch. It was in a brown paper bag. The cat had eaten my lunch except for the crust. It didn't like the crust. I took it had a ham sandwich. He ate the center out of the sandwich. So I had a more secure lunchbox after that. No more brown paper bags. Up to Bill Richards, a lot of you people knew him at Warren's Corners. Uh, he had his dairy cows. They were lacking something in their diet, apparently. They were always eating sparkling wires off his tractor when he left it in the barnyard, and was there most of the time. So we had to make a special shield on the side of the uh, tractor to keep the cows from eating up the sparkling wires, because they need, they need to set off every day until we got to cover up. So, I don't know what was in the wires, but it was lacking in their diet. Now, we accidentally learned years ago that starting ether, and you've all used that, uh, really burns your eyes if you get it in your eyes. Paul Carson was messing around with a little engine, he shot and he got his eyes. And we got him under water faucet, and he was out of commission for six or eight minutes. Then I got thinking, hmm, I'll bet that'd be a pretty good dog repellent, or maybe a goose repellent, or anything else you need. <laughs> so uh, we tried that. And it worked. If you give a dog a shot of that in the face, they find something else to do for at least six or eight minutes. <laughs> <laughs> later on, the postman and the meter readers, they had what they called mace. And I think that's just hot pepper. But, uh, I had a little tidbit to here. I, this is not necessarily in order as the years go by. Uh, 
John Ripson over in Asheville, he traded in an old inboard boat to Karstens. And uh, Paul, and I don't remember who else, no, they decided that <clears throat> they're going to take that down to the lake and put her in the water and go play with the boat. So the old tilt bed truck we had then was the Dodge truck with Newey Weldad. They backed it down into the water far enough to get the boat off of it. Well, then the emergency brake let go on the truck all, all, all dropped in the water. I didn't know that that night. And uh, the next morning we come into work and there's the old Dodge sitting there with seaweed hanging off the, hanging off the spring shackles and it's all wound up in the tires. What the heck happened here? And then we got the story later on. So. I had, uh, sometimes when you run into new customers, and I hate to say this, ladies, but the ladies are worse than the men. If you've never met them before, and they might not be real happy because we're there either bringing something new or coming to work, and they didn't want the money spent. I don't know what the reason is. I went to this place down the window, though, and, and Dwayne, you'll, you'll figure this one out. Uh, they raised hogs. And this lady, she dressed in high heel shoes and looked like she was headed to New York City to go shopping when she fed the ox. And uh, well, anyway, we sold a new John Deere corn planter. Um, one or other guy delivered it a few days earlier. And uh, we were supposed to be there, on, I was supposed to be there on a Thursday, I guess. Yeah, Thursday to start it. My truck broke down, so I had no vehicle, I couldn't make it. So I went a day later, Friday. So I get there. And she comes out, and she proceeds to start chewing on me, up one side and down the other. I think I learned a couple new swear words that I didn't know before. And she just was going all over me. She says, you know better, you shouldn't come on Friday. Her husband worked construction. She says, today's payday, he's sitting in a bar someplace drinking, he ain't even going to be here. <laughs> so she was going to have to go to the field and get started with the corn planting. So she carried on and on. Finally, I says, are you about through? And she looked at me and her mouth dropped open. She said, what did you say? I said, are you about through? <laughs> I said, you know, that's why I go to work every day, so I don't have to listen to my wife talk to me like that. <laughs> and she busted out laughing. And we were the best of friends ever since. <laughs> you know how I'm talking about the weed? Not really. Not on the Lindenville Road, just south of 18. Right in your neighborhood there. On the east side of the road, Mrs. Ray's eyes. <coughs> they don't agree more out Mrs. Hay. Y'all remember her? Yeah. We, we nicknamed her Tony. She reminded me of Tony Fields, the old uh, comedian from many years ago. So we, we, yeah, we were privy to a lot of experiences being out on the road and uh, doing work for everybody. Okay. Most all of our new equipment at that time, at Karstens, came in on the railroad. Uh, we unloaded at Burt, right over here on the Hojack, no dock. We unloaded right here in Wilson, no dock. And uh, we unloaded at Gasport, no dock there either. And Batavia had a big dock, and occasionally in Niagara Falls they had a big dock off from Hyde Park. So anything we got here locally, we had to drag it out of the truck onto a tilt bed. I drag it out of the railroad car and onto the tilt bed and then lower it to the ground and then do whatever we had to do with it, depending on what it was. So one day we're over to Burt, and we got a load of 16A flail choppers. Some of you dairy farmers, you know what a flail chopper is. Well, we, they, we had a flat car. We got them off the rail car one at a time onto the tilt bed truck, put them on the ground, four of them. So we had them all lined up there, and Paul Carson, he looks them all over, and he says, you know what? He said, let's hook them all together. They all had a tongue on them and a hitch on the back. We'll tow them all with a pickup truck. We'll take four of them one trip. So we got back to the shop at Carson's, and his dad was not impressed. <laughs> <laughs> now, Paul thought he had a big stroke of business because he saved three extra trips going for them, them shoppers. <laughs> uh, that's the way things go, you know. <laughs> After I got my shoulders license, I got to do a lot more trucking. And one time my wife and I, uh, we had to go to uh, the far side of Maryland to pick up the uh, new self-propelled windrower for Dick Schultz over in Rancho. We left at 3 o'clock in the morning and got back 2 o'clock the next morning. 23 hours straight working, no sleep. 
And uh, we had to take some of it apart to get it to fit on the truck. And uh, on the way back to Pennsylvania, we got a tank full of bad gas. We couldn't make over 30 miles an hour on a level road. So at the next gas station they come to, we pulled in and told the guy, he said, hey, I've got almost a full tank of gas here. We need to drain it. I need new gas. I said, where can we put it? And he says, just pull over there by that green and the black top. I said, really? <laughs> <laughs> Well, you're the boss, we're going to be leaving, you're going to be here yet, you know, so, so we did, we pulled the plug and drained that tank, it was probably 30 gallons of gas, and right down into the, some kind of a sewer pipe, got new gas, and uh, then the truck run great, but you know what, on that trip, to this day, the last thing I ever remember coming home was coming down the Dansville Hill, and I don't remember a thing since then, coming through Batavia, the Alabama swamps, and coming back to DB Road, it was a total blank. And that, I slept for almost 24 hours after that. I didn't work that day. So not going to ever do that again, that's for sure. Uh, one time I had a little experience. I was driving a traded in an international combine from the reservation, an old international. And uh, there was a chain drive with sprockets on the back of the final drives. I come down up the mountain road, and I got to Baker Hill, and when I crested the hill and the slack came off of the drive chains, the chains broke and jumped right off the sprockets. So now I'm not coming down the hill with no control, no brakes, all I got is a steering wheel. When I dropped the, the grain platform on the road, that gives you a little braking action. So I had sparks flying and dust and rust flying all over the place. Right at the bottom of the hill at that time, there used to be a guy that had a tire business there in his house. And garage. He stood there and watched the whole thing. And I stopped right there by his driveway. And he came out, and I never forgot his, his state. And he says, You got a problem? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got a problem. <laughs> so the chains were broken. So we used this phone. That's before cell phones, before two way radios. So I had to call back to Carson's and send out a rescue mission, some new chains and some tools, and get it fixed. So. <laughs> Now, many times we were unloading trucks at Carson's. We didn't always have a loader, a forklift or a loader very right handy. So we'd go up the road and borrow uh, Paul's brother-in-law, Dave Wilson's tractor. It was a John Deere 1020 with a loader on it. So one day I'm coming down Chester Road, headed to the corners, and the steering wheel come disconnected. And the tractor started to go towards the ditch. I stood on the brakes and tried to get it stopped, lowered the loader, well, it went down in the ditch, two forks on it. They went down from the ditch and up in the guy's lawn. They made the nicest pair of trenches you've ever seen. Another lawn to fix. We were always fixing the lawns. Something was always happening where we messed somebody's lawn up. We found out later, those tractors, when you put a loader on them, and if it bounced a little bit, the engine was the frame on those tractors, like an old Ford, or some of the internationals. The tractor do this. And the steering shaft across the top just had a little notch uh, with a roll pin, so it'd open up and you'd lose connection to the steering wheel. Nice thought when you're going down the road. You know? <laughs> this is good. <laughs> I was sent down to the first Wilson Burt Road here one day to get a tractor, and, uh, and I won't, I'm not going to mention names here. Uh, there might be somebody here that remembers this or was involved. Anyway, it was in March, and uh, it was muddy, and uh, I got this tractor pick up that wouldn't run. I come back out, and I got stuck in the driveway. But the driveway was a right of way across the lawn. It was supposed to be used as a driveway. But uh, anyway, I got stuck. So I, was, I had some white chains on the truck, and I threaded chains through the dual tires on the truck, and I got myself chewed on there and off the highway, got the chains out, and came home. But needless to say, my boss got a phone call, another yard to fix. So I had to go back there, seeing how I want to screw it up, I had to go to the fix them. Go back there with a small truck and a pile of topsoil. And I stopped in my house because I was driving right by. And I figured, well, I got to do a good job. So I got me some fertilizer. I, I was using nature's liquid fertilizer then. And I had the grass seed from Perry's. So I had got a rake and a shovel, got it all smoothed out, got the grass seed, got it all watered. Then I decided, yeah, we're going to give her a lot of fertilizer. 
So the rest of that year, every time I drove down that road, I'd get a laugh because there was two green streets all the way across the lawn where that grass was twice as dark as the rest of the grass. And even next year, it was still growing really good with that nature's fertilizer. That might have cost me five dollars out of my pocket, but <laughs> it was worth it. See, my philosophy my whole life, and you guys that work for you know this, I never get mad. I get even. <laughs> it's more fun. And I have an awesome memory, I don't forget. If it takes 15 years to get even, until I have the right occasion. Yeah, let me uh, way back when we were hauling tractors, you always had to remember to take the seat off the tractor before you went down the road. Otherwise, <laughs> and then the boss would be buying a customer a new seat. So later years, why the seats don't blow off anymore. But we used to get great directions for making deliveries. One that was a uh, classic from Arnold Karsten. The directions we had, we were looking for a little green building with a wood pile out behind it at 10 p.m. at 10 o'clock at night. It's pitch black dark. How are we supposed to see a little green building with a wood pile behind it? Total darkness, but that's the kind of directions we used to get. I went to an address on Creek Road over to Youngstown. And all the houses in the area where I should be were out behind pine trees. Couldn't see the houses. Couldn't read house numbers. But there were six or seven mailboxes all right beside each other on the other side of the road. Some got numbers, some don't. How are you supposed to correlate that mailbox to what house? That's the kind of direction. So you had to figure out where to take this. And of course, you had to deal with the, uh, the occasional mail <coughs> dog that was running around too, or whoever wanted to come out and greet you. <coughs> now, one of our drivers there years back at Perry's, they dropped the John Deere B tractor off on the Bridgman Road there in Sanborn in a guy's driveway, wrong place. This guy never owned a tractor, didn't know how to start a tractor, how to move a tractor, nothing. But luckily there was a uh, decal on the side of the tractor yet. He was able to look the phone number and call and we had to send somebody up there to move the tractor. It was about two houses off. I don't remember the guy's name anymore. But if you never had a tractor before and all of a sudden you come home and work and there it is in your driveway, you know. Uh, we had a new hire. We got sent up to Flemmy Danowitz to bring in a U.S. international bailer. Well, we got a phone call. The guy finally gave up, but anyway, Flemmy's wife called and talked to the boss. So she watched this guy for about 15 minutes, trying to hook the pickup truck up to the wagon hitch on the back of the bailer so he could bring it home. <laughs> <laughs> he finally gave up, came on out. So, we had a new hire at Perry's was sent to Don Walks to get a used bailer that he traded in. But he didn't know what a bailer was. Of course, the boss never, never educated him. Or he just assumed he knew. So uh, <clears throat> he was gone a long time. He brought back a greenhead on a wagon. When I asked why he'd done that, he said, well, it was already loaded in a wagon, and it looked like it was ready to go. So <laughs> <laughs> oh, we had to take the wagon back. Uh, some of these farms, and uh, some of you guys can attest to this. I've about lived at these places over the years. How many times a year is at your house, Dwayne? Quite a few. Yeah, quite a few. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, down walks, I got a call one day to come up with this combine. He'd driven outside up the run while they were on loading the truck loaded at. When he came out to uh, move the combine, it wasn't running. And didn't want to crank over very good. And he checked the dipstick with no oil on the stick. So he put oil back in it. By that time it cooled down, and he didn't get it started, but it was knocking. And then they see oil running down the side of the combine. So I got a call, went up there, hung over the engine upside down, and I found on the back side of the engine, we had a drain hose on the filter housing. And it was just a cotton braid hose, which would be a garden hose. And the mice and the rats had ate through the hose, and they just pumped all the oil right out of the engine. And, now that was a long time ago, and it was about $8,000 to fix that engine. We had to take it out, set it out, and get the, the bearings um, in the bottom of the engine, the reline board. But uh, so from that time on, whenever we monkeyed in one of them, we, uh, we put a hydraulic hose back on with a steel brake. Let them rats try that. So now Dwayne's sitting right here, and you'll remember this you had a similar situation with your combine. You got diesel fuel in your oil and diluted it. 
and uh, because the seal was shot on the injection pump, and it'll dump a fuel oil in and diluting the oil. Now, uh, see if my memory's better than yours. You had it running the day you were going to bring it up to the shop, and you finished chores. But when you came back out, why well, it was kind of knocking and hammering and not running very good. And in the end, why well, I think you towed it up with a tractor, and we had to do a complete engine job on that one too. Yep, I figured you would. Anything that gets in your billfold, you're going to remember. <laughs> 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 and Perry's one of our guys was delivering a brand new grain auger. I don't know, this might have been yours. It happened down on 18. He was going down the road with a little 40 count of line pickup we had there at the time. Had a little bump in the road, and uh, the hips fell right off the back of the truck. So here's a 38 or a 48 foot auger that was on the back of the truck. He let off on the gas, the auger passed the truck and went down in the road. Oh, total, brand new auger. We always had something going on, I'll tell you. Now here's something I, uh, my boy just gave me last night from North Carolina. Uh, this is a little bit political. With the war on drugs going on, we have more drugs than we ever had. With the war on terror going on, we now have more terrorists than ever. Maybe next year we can have a war on farm markets. We'll get some more farm markets. One of our crazy boys was bringing in a used tandem axle manure spreader one day from over this way. And apparently the wheel bearings had never been greased. And he got down in the corner of Chestnut and Beebe and had his self and the wheels locked up. And just stalled the truck right dead. He couldn't move it. And we had to go back to the tilt bed truck and drag it on. <clears throat> I got a call one night from a customer at 10 o'clock at night, and he said the bailer was shearing flywheel pens, and uh, he finally gave up. So I went there in the morning, and apparently it was quite wet. The dude come down probably at 7 o'clock, and they were bailing to almost 10 when he called me, I guess. So I get there, and he's right, you know, he's shearing pins all right. Uh, I couldn't hardly, it was a wire bailer, and I had all the tension off. And I had to drive a big tire iron or a big screwdriver in between the slices and the bail after I cut the wires and take it out a slice at a time. And it's still hard. Well, as I got closer to the center of the baler, I could start to smell skunk. <laughs> so I kept going because I had to get all that out of there. And lo and behold, right up underneath the twisting mechanism, there was a skunk they bailed up that night. That's why they didn't want to fix the bailer. They called me. I <laughs> tried <laughs> So we got it out of there, and we got the bailer fixed and got it on. So now this one, you guys, are, you're going to figure this out. When our third series of bail throwers came out on the market, I delivered a new bailer to a customer that had never had a bail thrower before. I explained to him how to tilt the thrower on turns to get the bail into the wagon and not lose it, and then you tilt it into the wind if you had a crosswind blow and keep them in the wagon. And to be extra careful if you were near a highway that you didn't throw any out the road. So uh, on our very first trip across the field, the very first turn, he threw a bale right out into the bear road. Luckily there was no cars coming. You know who would know where that was? Uh, oh, come on, I'm, I'm losing you guys here. Just north of Route 31. Bear Road, Human Road. Flemish. Oh, yeah. yep. the now, today there's a big shop there. <clears throat> yeah, that was a hayfield. It used to be right on the edge of the road. And just as slick as that, right out in the road. I said, that's what you're not supposed to do. So, I had to stay there for a while and train them how to do that. So, Brown bailers, that was a problem when they come along. Uh, we had a few people that had some hilly areas. When you dump that round bale out, you've got to turn the bale crossways. Otherwise, the bale rolls right down the hill. <laughs> and it could wipe out somebody's car, or wipe out flower beds, or who knows what. It's happened a lot of places. I started a new baler and a thrower up North Tonawanda Way. All they had was a flat hay wagon. And they didn't have a bale wagon. <clears throat> and they wanted to put a man on the wagon to stack the bales. I said, well, okay, we can do that because we can, that was the newer kicker. We could adjust how far it would go. I said, but you've got to uh, stay back. We'll set the bale right up on the wagon. 
And uh, don't be reaching down there with a bale hook and trying to pull that bale off the pan. Because if you do, it's going to trip, and you're going to be at the back of the wagon or even off the wagon. And this, because it was brand new bale, we had to establish a length on the bale and get it all adjusted first. So I'm walking alongside of it. We bailed a couple of bales, and we finally had it about where we wanted. I looked back, and the guy's got a bale hook right in the bale. I got the guy on the driver on the tractor. I said, whoa, quick, quick, right here. Pull the drop pin on the wagon. I said, okay, go ahead. I said, you want to kill somebody, you do it after I leave. But uh, we'll just bail on the ground now. So out comes a Jeep. They come out with a Jeep and hook on this hay wagon. So we're coming down the other side of the hay field now. We probably got 30 or 40 bales. And I happened to look over there just to see this <coughs> the hay wagon uh, all of a sudden went like this. The, uh, the, the hay wagon wasn't fastened down to the running gear. And they put too many bales on the back end of the rack and up away. And I think, oh, man. These guys weren't farmers. They, they weren't. And, uh, but, uh, uh, there's so many things that happen with the metal throwers. And you guys probably know of one or two guys up that way that got hurt back twice in eight or nine years. Didn't learn the first time. And, uh, the, there's an inherent danger in some of these machines. There's no getting around that. We would uh, present service schools for farmers at the shop uh, in the winter months, usually, or early spring, uh, on various different machines. So all you farmers would come in, and uh, we could teach you some of the things to be looking for uh, when you wanted to check it over and get it ready for the season. And uh, so it was always on a weeknight, usually from 7 to 10 o'clock. And we'd have coffee and pop and pizza afterwards. Well, one night I had a baler school. And I rigged up the twine box on the baler to get an important point across. It is a twine box, not a tool box or a garbage can. Because a lot of balers I go out to work on, you open up the twine box because it ain't time. And there's a crescent wrench wrapped up in the twine or a hammer handle. So uh, anyway, I rigged this up. So uh, I opened the thing up and I started throwing things out of it like bail hooks, wrenches, hammers, empty beer cans, and a roll of toilet paper. And I threw the toilet paper right up over the audience, and it unrolled as it went over. And everybody's laughing. My boss, Ron Perry, is sitting there, and he did not laugh. He didn't see the humor in that. Everybody else thought it was kind of funny. <laughs> I always like to have a little humor in my uh, little demonstrations we've done. We had a guy's combine in there one time. And uh, it had a rock trap on it, and I wanted to demonstrate a rock trap. Well, the guy that owned this was very fussy, and he didn't even have any rocks on his farm. Well, I brought some in from home. I had a bunch of them there, about yeah, that big around, five or six. Put them in the rock trap, closed her up. So I got all these guys standing around me, and I crawl under there, and I says, Hey guys, <clears throat> you got to open up this here rock trap every day. I pulled their lever, and out come the rocks. This guy's standing there. What? Where did that come from? I don't even have any rocks. <laughs> now we used to get, uh, we had the, uh, the misfortune uh, to always work wherever the machine broke usually. If it was out in the middle of the field and it was five degrees, that's where we worked on it. And if it was raining, you put on a rain suit and boots and that's where you worked on it. It didn't matter if it was hot or cold or raining and snowing. Me and my co-workers, we had an unwritten rule amongst us. If it was miserable weather and the customer was working with us, we'd stay there as long as the customer would. We would put up just as long as the customer. And usually they'd cry uncle before we would, but not always. If the guy only showed up in a pickup truck every 15 minutes and then left again, uh-uh, we're not going to do it either. One day I was working with Starlight Acres uh, in their pole barn. And we worked on it a week. We gutted this combine. We went right through the combine. And the warmest day we had was 18 degrees. But we were under a roof and we didn't have any wind. But I remember Larry and Ward walking up and down the barn there trying to get their feet warmed up. Because when you're standing still, you, get, you tend to get cold. And I got cold too. We worked for uh, about a whole week over at Red Christmas on a combine outside, 15 to 20 degrees temperature, installing new tracks and reworking the grain platform in the feeder house dry so we could use tracks on the grain platform so we could harvest the sunflowers. It was a real muddy, 
the season that year. And uh, I was hoping Ron Perry was going to be here tonight. I invited him, but I don't see him. So anyway, I wanted to tell Ron, uh, now it can be told. Standard procedure on cold, wet days back then was to leave the truck run all day long so that we had a warm place to crawl into. We'd work until our fingers had no feelings left in them. We'd just stick them down with the prostate tubes, give them a feeling in them, and go back out to do some more work. He probably wondered why his trucks burned so much gas in winter time. <laughs> we were out there eight hours, the truck sit there eight hours running. One of my old co-workers and I were just talking Sunday after church uh, about this, and he says, why did we ever do that? I says, because we were young and stupid. It was real, I guess. But probably the most fun service call that I ever had was over at Gangs on the Slayton Settlement Road. And uh, that, their house is right across the road from where Kowalski is today. In fact, Frank, that was your grandfather's yeah. farm. And uh, so anyway, I get a phone call to go over there. Uh, the boys are out there, Phil and gang, and I don't remember the other, which other boy it was. They were mowing grass with a flail mower they had on the back of their John Deere 1020 tractor. And uh, the tractor stalled and the mower wouldn't run no more what their mother told me when she called. So I get over there, they had run over the garden hose. They had run over and wrapped up a hundred foot of garden hose around that flail mower. And they're trying to tell me what happened, how it happened, and they couldn't. They're rolling on the ground, holding on their ribs, just laughing. They got me to laughing. Their mother came out, she said she was on the phone to see the lunch sprinkler go by the window at a hundred foot <laughs> It took about three hours sitting out there with a hacksaw and a captain's knife and a hammer and a chisel, and a nylon hose. That's tough stuff. Wrapped around the shaft, wrapped around all those flails. But that that was a fun job. They got me laughing. We all sat there laughing the whole rest of the afternoon. When I went back to the shop, I tried to tell the other guys and I'd get to laughing. You know? <laughs> now we had a lot of serious work too. I can say, I don't have every story on there that we ever ran into. My co-worker, Joe, Joe Slade, who today is our pastor and our country music band leader, uh, we were in a job over on Bob Beach Park here in New Fane, and we were installing a PIP program. PIP program was Product Improvement Program, uh, bundle on his corn picker. Well, Joe was up on top of the picker about to drill some holes, and I was at the back of my truck getting some more tools, and all of a sudden I heard Joe scream, and I look over my shoulder and he's laying on the ground. And I said, what happened to you? He says, that, that electric drill. He says, it really zapped me and knocked him right off the top of the corn picker. Well, what it was, this electric drill was back then the drills weren't double grounded and all that. It was an all metal drill. And our electricity was from our generator, which is not grounded. And this drill was one that our foreman made one out of two. We had two of them in our shop that were both zapping us all the time when you were using them in the shop. And uh, he was going to save the company some money and he sent us all of this. So I'd done the only thing that could be done. I killed that drill so it wouldn't kill anybody else. I took a big hammer to it and I just broke her all to pieces. And cut the cord off, went back to the shop and I handed Roger our thick cord. I says, here, what? Oh, he was spirogasted. I told him what had happened. Well, he didn't have to do that. I said, yes, I did. I says, you monkeyed around a half a day with them two drills, and we still had nothing left, and we were all done. And uh, then we tried to kill Joe, electrocute him up in the air on top of the machine, knock him on the ground. So that's that. Michael Bard worked there for a while. Him and I were sent down to the Curves Brothers farm in Lindaville to work on the machine. When we got there, the door was locked on the barn. Not a soul around. Of course, that's before cell phones. We didn't have a two-way radio with us. So it was a dirt driveway and a dirt floor in the, in the shop. I always had a small shovel in my truck with me. I said to Mike, I says, let's dig in. So we dug under the door. Mike was a smaller guy, he was like, eh, 120 pounds. So we dug a trench under the door, got Mike under the door inside, and unlocked the door, opened her up, and got the job done. So we thought that was kind of comical. When we got done, we put the dirt back in the trench. Locked her back up. We couldn't lock it up because we were outside. And uh, went back and told Roger what we'd done. He was very mad at us, really mad, to think that we would break into the customer's barn. I said, wait a minute. 
He knew we were coming. He's the one that wanted us there. And then he wasn't there and he didn't know a lot. So the one thing we always done, and I know some of you guys will attest to this, if we're called out to do a job, we're going to do it one way or another. Now, we don't like to turn around and go back home and say, yeah, no, that's too hard, too tough. Another time, I was working in the same barn all by myself, and I had my radio running all afternoon, which I always done, good old country music. Got ready to go home, the battery was dead. Couldn't start the truck. No cell phone, no two-way radio. So I looked around in that barn, and he had stored some other equipment for neighbors. There was a cleaner combine in there that had a battery on it. Ah, look at that. So I got up on the combine and tried it. It worked. It would crank the motors. Yep, that'll work. So I borrowed a battery off that combine and switched it with my truck. Got back to the shop. And then in a few days, we got back there and put the battery back in the combine. So if any of you guys are ever missing a battery sometimes, <laughs> we might have needed it to get home. <laughs> You people here in the audience, uh, have any idea how to tell if a cowboy driving a pickup truck is married? There's tobacco juice on both side mirrors. <laughs> <laughs> and that joke is for Barney and Mary Ellen. Anybody in the crowd that remembers Barney, Lynn Barnum and Mary Ellen, they both chewed. Some people might not have knew that Mary Ellen chewed, but she did. Barney was so proud that he got her to chew the back <laughs> So that was for them tonight. Now, Frank, where's your dad sitting here? Right here. Oh, the back. okay. It's awful quiet. He's in the, hey, Dick. Yeah. You're in the story now. Oh, God. <laughs> One time, just about the whole Perry's crew got wiped out down the road at Dick and Lottie's restaurant. We used to go down there for a few beers after work. But thanks to Joe's Eggmaster, he brought in a bottle of homemade hooch that he called Austrian spring water or swizzle wits, whatever you want to call it. And we all had not too much of that, and nobody showed up for work the next morning at Perry's except the foreman. <laughs> Even Big Joe didn't show up, Wayne didn't show up. Wayne was about the same age as Roger, the foreman, and Roger was really upset with him because he was supposed to be old enough to know better. I got my butt in there about noon that day, but uh, that stuff, I don't know what it was, Dick. It was clear as water. It burned all the way down. <laughs> it probably should have been used for bug killer or baby You didn't put it in the baby shower, I'll tell you. So, anyway, you had a hand in uh, wiping out the whole Perry's crew one time. <laughs> I always enjoy doing good deeds for people. That's my style. And I wish that uh, we had uh, Barry in the center tonight, but we don't. Uh, one day I had to pull Barry's tow truck out of the ditch. Because <laughs> he came around the corner too fast, and Ewing's on the chest, and the road is icy, right into the ditch. And I just happened to come along in my service truck. He's out there <laughs> like this, hey, hey. So I had to pull him out. He said, don't tell my dad. I said, oh, no, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> but I might tell a whole lot of other people. <laughs> we did it. Our next track poll meeting, like, we, we put it right in the minutes. We had our secretary read it. So. <clears throat> now, we had a lot of strange things happen over the years. Uh, one of Millville's big down here, four-wheel drives, 8760. They were not too far from here, right over on the Bailey Road working. And, uh, it started spraying fuel oil on the cab windows. They shut it down, and I got called over there the next morning to check it out and see what was going on. There was a clamp around the dipstick tube and the fuel line that had come loose, wore through the fuel line, wore through the dipstick. It not only was spraying fuel oil on the cab windows, it was spraying fuel oil into the crankcase, into the engine oil. So we took that apart, and I repaired it with a piece of hose. Once again, doing work out on the road, we're always making ice cream on a fly crap. You have to fix it with whatever you got with you. So I had some holes, we fixed it with a hose. But uh, we drained the oil, drained the filters, and, and we got it all changed and back to work. <coughs> Another time I went on a service call at the shooting range over behind the cabin range on uh, 78, Rice Corners. <coughs> they had to pull the driveway out to get me back there because it was all drifted, it was a snowy, windy day, and uh, 
Got back there, they put a hydraulic valve on a tractor. Now it's always nice to work on hydraulics. Your hands are oily, no gloves, and it's 10 degrees. It's blowing and it's snowing. And back in the truck four or five times, warm your fingers up, and go back out until you get it done. Got ready to leave, but couldn't leave because the driveway was dripping in again. Now we had to call and have the snowplow guy come back and plow us out to get us out. So those kind of things happen. Some of you, you old, I say old timers, and I'm right with you. Here. Years back, when you'd go to places where you had an older gentleman there, if you were to pick up a check for a repair job or you delivered a new tractor, they always done business over a drink of cider. You had to have a drink of cider with it. You weren't you were going to get the money. So I went to this guy's place one day east of Lockport, and I had taken this tractor back to Weed Overall. He says, come on in the kitchen, we'll have a drink of cider, and I'll get a check. So he gave me a glass of cider, and I took a taste of it. Oh, rock got terrible stuff. And I just a couple more sips. And they would be insulted if he didn't drink at all. <laughs> so finally I decided, the only way to do this is chug a log and get it over with. So, gone. He looked at me, oh, you love it. Here, have some more. <laughs> <laughs> no, I said, my boss is a teetotaler. If I go back with booze on my breath, I said, I'll get fired. He said, you're kidding me. I said, no, I'm not. I'm dead serious. So, and there again, that was cider. It shouldn't have been ingested. It should have been used for buck killer or baby. <laughs> it was just bad. But on the other hand, some farmers, they learned how to do it right. Albert Moss, he got his cider so good, it was clear as water. It looked like Boone's Farm apple wine, and it tasted just as good. That was good stuff. Spark spreaders over south of Gasport, they made three kinds of uh, cider. They had what they called their pop cider, with oranges, raisins, sugar, and so forth that they put on it. And they'd always take that to wedding receptions and dances and stuff like that. The women loved it, everybody loved it. Then they had their regular hard cider, then they had their applejack that they let freeze out the shop and they draw off the center that, that didn't freeze. That's the pure stuff. And like a half a water glass of that would set most anybody on the floor. <laughs> so that was just some of the, there was so many places you had to do that. I've had guys, you had to have wine, same thing, just terrible rot gut. Roy, I gotta, I gotta mention one there, you know this guy, <clears throat> Lenny over to Mill Mills. We had bought four or five bottles of wine over at Becker Farms Wine there one year at Christmas time to take and give for gifts. And the one we got was apple cranberry. We never tried it, we just thought ah, that sounds good. We opened it up, we had some company there one night, we tried it, it was terrible. Well, we don't want that. I was going back up to Dave's to work the next day, and I said, I called Dave, I said, hey, I got a bottle of wine here that nobody, four people didn't like it. He said, I'll bring it up, I'm going to drink it. So I took it up. I didn't see anybody for quite a few days after I got dropped off. One day I said to Dave, I said, uh, what did you think of that wine? He said, oh, that was great. But he says, he's got a philosophy. I said, yeah, what's that? And he says, all wine is better than water. <laughs> <laughs> now, John Deere had a large presence in this area with combines. We went through many wet falls over the years, and you guys know about it. Early on, we didn't have four-wheel drive combines, so we would take off the regular tires and wheels and put on oversized wheels and rice tires and create all kinds of concoctions. Put the tires on backwards, put bigger truck tires on the back to try to get the wheels to keep turning, anything to get through the mud. Uh, then we started to sell tracks when they came along. Of course, that was a lot of work. You had to remove the wheels and final drives and bolt on the track. And then we started taking out clutches and dry belts because now we're pushing everything harder than it was ever meant to be pushed. And of course, all that work was done in the heated shop. It was done right outside, wherever and whatever temperature it was. <clears throat> Back then, and this is a good thing, the farmers used to grow a little bit longer season growing corn. But it wasn't uncommon that if we had a, a muddy fall, we'd still be combining corn in January, February. So when we had breakdowns, we had some pretty miserable weather out there trying to fix the machines. Uh, we had worked on many jobs where we had a broken final drive and we had to take the track off where we would jack one to two feet of wooden blocks in the ground before we ever got the combine to raise up. One job in particular over at Hanson's, we, uh, we couldn't get it to raise at all. We used up all the blocks we had in the truck 
We used to go to Lump Lumber across the open prairies and he'd saw us off big blocks. Big fellow truck right up with blocks, take it with us. We went back with two three quarter inch four by eight plywood sheets and a big four jack. That spread the load around and often we were able to jack the machine up. Couldn't get close to the combine. We had a, a, a case, I think it was a case 930 tractor with a hay wagon behind it. We had the jack and our plywood on there and we got it within 20 or 30 feet of the combine as far as the tractor would go. And uh, we dragged that over by hand and uh, got it the combine, got it back up and got it apart. Uh, one that I never forgot was Bob McCown. He was working up here on Lower Mountain Road and he was broke down at the north end of the field, just a little bit east of the uh, Green Road. And he broke the final drive all to pieces, so we went up there with a new final drive. And uh, he had an Alice Chalmers XT 190 90 horse tractor. And we put that final drive, chained it to a plank, and skittered it across the field. And we got to within about 100 feet of the combine as far as the tractor would go. So somehow Bob and I, we made like a team of horses, and we dragged that final drive of the plank the other 100 feet to the combine. And to this day, I'll never know how, but we picked that up and bolted it back on the combine axle. They, they weighed 450 pounds. But that's why I got a bad back and bad knees now too, I guess. One of the reasons. And then we got the job done. He says, let's go down the road to the hillside and have a couple of beers. I had Jim Perry's car. And he's waiting for me back at the shop. The new thing. I said, Bob, I said, eh, one or two maybe. And uh, so I finally got back to Jim. He was pacing the floor because we were probably an hour or two late. So, but we didn't spend that much time in the barn. It was one season that we sold eight sets of tracks. Everybody was buying tracks. We were driving all over the country to get them bring them back. Uh, when you use tracks, and you guys did, you have to clean the mud out of them every night. If it's freezing because in the morning that'd be a throw solid, you gotta use your bar and your shovel and a hoe and whatever, unless you got a fire hydrant right nearby and hose and you can wash it out. Or do like shapers did one time, they pulled theirs into a little creek, let the water run through the track. That was a good idea. Except it warmed up overnight and it was raining someplace off south. And in the morning, the water level got above the Camp Mission on the combine and filled the Camp Mission up full of water. So then I had to go over there. <laughs> we backed it out of the creek and got the water drained out and put in new oil to keep her going. After a while, the tracks need adjusting. They wear off pretty fast, depending on the kind of soil you're working in. So that was a fun job. You had to take all the mud and dirt out and let off the adjustment and then take a pad off and take a connector link out, a pin about that big around, big sledgehammer, big bars, a lot of bull work, and a torch. And uh, to know what we survived, and we're, we're still here, we're still talking about it. Years back, a lot of you guys may have run into this, we used to get a lot of bad diesel fuel. When it got cold, it would gel up and the tractors wouldn't run. They might start an idle, but they wouldn't do anything. I got a call one day with a combine over on Route 31 at Carmen Road, right in the road. It died. I went over there, and uh, he was right. It wasn't getting any fuel. Took the assembly bowl off. Nothing came right off the assembly bowl. I screwed the whole assembly right off the bottom of the tank, and a stick of fuel just slid out of the bottom of the tank. And, you know, about three eighths of an inch in diameter, the size of the pipe there. And we just let that whole thing just slither out of there and onto the road. There's nothing much you can do for it. Today, we do have some additives that will straighten that out to some degree. But everybody's using much better fuel than we used to way back. This would be whenever you got 5 degrees and 10 degrees, we'd get service calls all over the place where tractors wouldn't start. I went to mill mills once and their pickup trucks would start up and idle, but they wouldn't drive down the road. And they went down to Smoking Joe's and got some KE100D. And so within about a half an hour, why they worked again. But uh, just one of those quirky things that we used to run into there. Now we had one customer that everybody in our shop loved to work on it when it came in. The cab on that combine was like a delicatessen. There were hard candies, candy bars, sun gems, chips, hobos, pepperoni slices. Jammed into that combine cab all around inside of there. And of course, we never touched any of that. <laughs> now we had another customer. Uh, he had a mechanic working there, and he had a great big long six-foot rollaway box. And it was the same thing. It was like a delicatessen on wheels. 
He had two of them six foot long drawers just jammed full of all kinds of junk food and goodies. But he kept that locked. <laughs> well, he could get that when he had a key. So, at the same shop, quite a few years ago, Bob Hoover decided to stop in there one day with a milk truck. And what a deal that was. He unloaded half a truckload in one stop. He had all the micro workers there packing cabinets, plus the regulars working in there. So, <clears throat> with the chocolate milk and the milk and the Hoover's famous orange drink, he unloaded about a half a truck right there in one stop. And from that, they still go there today. There was about 25 guys there between the, the uh, migrants and the uh, back in the house and the regulars inside the shop there. So that was a great deal that uh, Bob made there. <clears throat> all of my customers, I think you're all guilty, every one of you, you had a favorite saying. We used to joke about it at the shop. While you're here, could you look at this? Or could you look at that? Uh, do you know anything about this? Or anything about that? Oh, hey, we'd always tackle it. So over the years, we got, I got, and a lot of the other people got, I know I've been in basements working on water pumps and hoses, swimming pool filters and hoses, the wife's lawnmower, put up some clothesline for a couple of women over the years, changed fuses in the fuse box in the basement, some pumps in the basement, get them working or find out why they didn't, uh, work on the wife's car, because her husband never got to it, <laughs> jump start car batteries and truck batteries all over the place, Pull stuck cars and trucks out of ditches and snow banks when they're going down the road. And I always try to help people out. Help fix fence. I've actually helped fix fence. The guys had some cows get out. Worked on side of long loaders. That really wasn't our expertise. And uh, grain dryers, and the stirrers and the grain dryers. I remember climbing up Kenny Cooper. Five gallon pail, put what wrenches we thought we needed with a rope go up the side of the green pen, and then pull your five-gallon pail toolbox up there and have your wrenches. Make sure you didn't drop anything in the corn, because now you've got 30 feet of corn and it's going to sizzle down through. One time over at Cooper's, I had to cut a pork chop bone out of his, cuss, out of his police dog's throat. Kenny and, um, oh, what was his buddy's name? Nick Kirsch. They were holding the dog still best they could. And I had a pair of bolt cutters about that. <laughs> so, we had a lot of things that was not in our job description. <laughs> we got to work on lawnmowers too, which wasn't my favorite thing, but uh, we had to do it. I got a call from Eli Rickard one time up on the rest. And uh, he was kind of a comedian. And uh, he wanted me to come right away. He told me his wife's lawnmower had bled to death out in the middle of the yard and wouldn't move. And I just said, what? He says, it bled to death. He says, the ground is all red, all around the tree, you know, it won't move. And uh, of course, I had to give him a little hard time. I says, hey, I don't work on the machines I can't get under. He says, you just get up here. We'll have it taken care of. When I got up there, him and his wife had jostled that thing around and got the front wheels up on the second step of the back porch of the house. So the tractor's sitting like this. He says, here, can you get under that? <laughs> See, I had to get under that. It was a hydrostatic drive, and they used automatic transmission fluid for red oil. But uh, that was the only one that I ever said that had bled to death. A steel line had broken off. And that was more miserable to work on that than some big tractor. I'd rather work on a big four wheel drive anytime. No room, everything's crammed together. And then we had to order it and go back and put it together. It was harder to put the new one back in that wasn't broken than it was getting the broken one out. Got a call uh, on a lawnmower up in Pendleton one time. And when I got there, there was nobody there, but the engine was totally shut. It was locked right up, and it had a hole through the side of it. It seems a customer drained the oil out to change it one morning. He discovered he had no oil, so he hopped in the car and went to the nearest store to buy some oil. Meanwhile, a wife comes out, hops on the lawnmower, and starts to mow until the engine went. Rrr. So they needed a whole new motor. I want, this was a comical one. I got to laughing at that one. The guy couldn't understand why I was laughing. I went on a call up the Pendleton for a tractor that wouldn't start, and the guy had just put a brand new battery in it. I found that the customer put the battery cable clamp over the plastic cover on the battery. <laughs> well insulated. <laughs> no power whatsoever. I seen that and I started laughing. And I said, what's so funny, what's so funny? I hated to tell him that he 
But she kind of take them off the bed. <laughs> This one here, Dwayne, is down here in the woods. This is way back at uh, Paris. I took a new lawn tractor with a snowblower to a customer, a new customer in Barker, middle of winter. And this gentleman was probably 50 years old at the time. And he was like a kid on Christmas morning. He couldn't wait to get on that baby and try it. He had a rain, brand new rain suit. He had on, uh, eye goggles, ski mittens. He was ready for bear. Well, we got them started up, we got on there. And the, the houses are pretty close right there. He lived on the main east west road. I don't remember the name of the road there now. Anyway, just the driveway between the houses. And he went maybe 10 feet and he picked up a dog bone and threw it right through the neighbor's bay window. <laughs> <laughs> the kicker was this guy, his business was selling insurance. <laughs> so, so he was covered. I hope, I hope he had good insurance. Now, I took a new 140 lawn tractor up to a customer in Pendleton on Beach Ridge Road. And uh, with a rototiller on the back. And I didn't know nothing about rototillers. And uh, but there was, I was going up that way in call, so he had to, had to take with it. So, same thing, this guy just like a kid on Christmas morning, he just couldn't wait to get on there. So, of course, the, the soil up there, it's, uh, I call that Pendleton sand, it's all hard clay. It's as hard as this floor is here, below the rug. And uh, so, he got on there, we got it fired up. He dropped that rototiller in the ground, and he went across that garden about 10 or 15 miles an hour. One wheel spinning backwards, and he's hanging on for dear life. I'm standing on the end of the field lap, and I'm doubled right over. I had no idea what was going on. But one of it was driving on the rototiller tines. <laughs> Turns out to be, on those rototillers, there was a single collimator tooth about that long. that was supposed to be bolted in the center, and that dug in the ground, and it would hold you back so the rototiller could do its thing. Well, the guy who put it together at the shop, he didn't know, he didn't read the directions. He didn't know where that tooth went, so he threw it. <laughs> so I get to take it out on the picture. <laughs> So at least the boss made that guy take that thing up and put it on the road to him. So the customer in the end, he was he was happy. Now we were always always being sent on trips, and they might be delivery trips, uh, going out in East Cook among to pick up something uh, or the villa or something, and go to schools. We would go to schools, a lot of schools in Syracuse, New York, where the, the John Deere warehouse was at that time. But sometimes we were in Pennsylvania, sometimes across the river in Ontario. But uh, anyway, this one time, myself and another guy, we left on a Sunday afternoon about 1 o'clock and headed for East Lansing, Michigan. And we were to go to the uh, university out there. They had had a fruit show, and we were to pick up a Perry harvester. They used to build fruit harvesters down there. And another Halsey harvester, which came from California in a semi-truck. So. We got there, it was like 10 o'clock, 10.30 at night. We hadn't eaten yet, so we were carrying this little one-ton truck on the back of the big truck. And uh, we unloaded that, we decided we're gonna go get something to eat downtown. Well then, the other guy, Cliff, he wanted to show her. I don't know, okay. So we go in our room, he turns the water on, we waste and waste and waste. No hot water. Well, they made us park, it was an L-shaped motel. They made us park way at the far end so we wouldn't block traffic up with this big truck we had. It was in March. There weren't any tourists there. There weren't any other cars in the parking lot, but we had to be there. So we fussed around a little bit, and uh, Cliff was the other guy, and he said, what are we gonna do now? I says, we can walk around and go downtown and get some people. So uh, he says, really? I said, yep. I said, maybe it'll be hot when we get back. You know, once again, you gotta make do with what you got to work with. So we went down, got a little bite to eat, we come back, the steam was coming out under the door to our room. <laughs> Opened up the door, the water's dripping off the ceiling, the mirrors are all stacked over, the walls are all stacked over. We sit there laughing while we have water. <laughs> the next morning we found out what, why it took so long. There was a janitor there working for the cleanup, I guess, in the morning, Monday morning. 
there's a the door open, and here's a boiler room that was probably 200 to 250 feet away from where our room was. So it had to go all that distance to give us hot water. But we got it. <laughs> now, another school that I, myself, and two guys, I was working for Perry's, and two guys from uh, Oakfield, we went down to uh, Frederick, Maryland, to the John Deere Combine School, and the 9000 Series Combines came out. And our room was going to be in Best Western. So we got there on Sunday night, 7 o'clock or so. We hadn't eaten yet, so they said, yeah, help yourself with the food here, guys. So we ordered prime rib. Well, it was the worst prime rib we ever had. It was all fat and grizzled, greasy. I said, oh, man. And he said, help yourself with the salad bar. Well, everybody had already had, had their meal. It was picked over. Well, they had some rusty lettuce left on a plate and a few tidbits of this and that. And they said, you know what, guys? We're not having breakfast here. We're not going to give them another chance at us. So uh, that's fine. We go to our room. Well, that's when it got interesting. Uh, they had, the two of them were in a room and I had my own room. Well, I went in and I used the bathroom and I flushed the toilet and it came right up over the top. The water came right over the top of it and it's still running. And I look under the toilet, there's no valve on it, the center of the Man, I go to the closet, of course there's no plunger, they don't put a plunger in every hotel room. Like, man, what the hell am I going to do now? And all I done was pee in it, you know, no so toilet paper, and it's open and plug it. So, I looked at the menu on the phone, they had about three things to choose from. The closest thing I could find here was room service. So I dialed up room service. This lady, uh, she answers, she says, room service. I says, I'm on, I was on the fifth floor. I'm in five, whatever the room was. I said, I got a problem here. My toilet is running water right up on the top, right across the floor. And I'm sure the people down below are going to get upset in a little while when the drip's coming out of their ceiling. She says, well, we're a room service for food and drink. We have nothing to do with toilets. I said, hey. I said, the menu's right here. There's nothing on the menu that says anything about plumbers. I got a toilet that's leaking water. And I'm in a room, and I need service. To me, that's room service. She <laughs> says, okay, I'll take care of it. So, <laughs> we're always getting in trouble with water, it seemed like, for some reason. I, I don't know why. But, uh, so anyway, next morning, we decided we got to go to the school at the dealership down there. So we see a Roy Rogers restaurant there. Ah, we'll get breakfast there. So I'm first in line to get my scrambled eggs and some sausage, get back to the table. It's cold. They had it under a heat light, I call us. And so them two guys, they, they're coming back, and I'm headed back up to the counter. I said, you might as well turn around. Food's all cold. I said, we want fresh food and something. So we had to wait. They had to cook us some more food. So. When we got into the John Deere dealership, finally, we got an orientation from the instructor, and he says, uh, a couple of things I want to tell you guys. He says, I know all you guys are staying in the Best Western. He says, don't eat there. He says, their food sucks. I said, well, why, why didn't you send that out to the dealers when they uh, rented the room for us to tell you that the food sucks and don't eat there? No. And he says, oh, Roy Rogers restaurant, same thing, food sucks, don't go there. <laughs> well, it got worse. It's dinner that day was catered by some local outfit. They brought all their food in there, and it's what I call plastic food. They were all in styrofoam little boxes, and it was all cold. So some of the guys went downtown. We didn't know where to go or anything, so we kind of put up with it. But one of the guys was there, he says, go to a Bob Evans. Well, we had no Bob Evans here at that time. This was 1989. I'd seen him on TV advertising it. So we went to Bob Evans. That was OK. I remember I had catfish that night for supper. And that's where we had all the rest of our meals. That, that was good. But that's another thing. When you're out on the road going to schools, you can get a lot of pretty bad food. And sometimes John Deere was the one that fixed it for us, too. So uh, it was Sometimes we did a good job. Now, when we, the next year, we went to uh, another combine school in Chestertown, Maryland. And we stayed at a motel called the Fin, Fur, and Feather. And that was uh, in a restaurant there, and that was at Rock Glen on a small bay, five miles from the east end of the Chesapeake Bay Bridge. And uh, that was great. Chestertown is a city like Lockport. They didn't have a motel with all 35 people, and all in one place. And we had all 35 guys to go to school. So we stayed there, had our breakfast. It was great. They put us on a bus and took us out to this farm. Well. We ran into something we'd never seen before. We're going down this little town road, and uh, that'd be 
Well, we don't have any roads like that. Maybe the Hallberg Road. Uh, we're going down the road and there's signs all over the place. Stop, look at some listen. There's an airstrip that goes right across the road <laughs> for a spray plane that belonged to the spark. The cars had to come to a stop, look, listen, and then proceed. Because you might have an airplane coming down or take them off. So that's a little different. I know in Ohio, when we were out there a couple times, we were in where they had railroad tracks. Uh, the, they had no lights. They just had a sign that says railroad. So you want to do the same thing. You can't stop. But both ways, make sure. Now what we got to combine there was barley. Uh, they're ahead of us by quite a few weeks, and especially with barley. And that's the first time we ever got to climb on a 9600 John Deere combine. So we all got to drive it. I had a little fun with that, and I got to do my driving. They were cutting stubble about that high. So when I get in there, I hit the lever, and the guy says, what are you doing? I says, getting that straw. I said, back where I come from, the guys all want the straw. And we don't need a stubble or a foot and a half, two foot high. And we want it all. Oh, he wasn't too happy about that. Because what they were trying to promote was no grain going out the back. Well, I made him make walk back. He <laughs> <laughs> drives fast with all that straw in there. They had enough power to drive fast. So I had, the poor guy that was going to bail this straw, he had a New Holland 66 baler. You guys know what them were? Not very big. And 9,600 combines, pretty wide. And he told us, the game instructor, he said, don't stop, because if you do, you'll have a pile of straw that high that won't be able to bail it. So we got through that. Yes? No, Don, I said we probably should stop and ask some qu anyone has any questions at this point. OK. And I got about uh, three pages. Go ahead. OK. Uh, I took a brand new field chopper down to Dick and Barb Austin's. And uh, I was in the movies that day. That was quite an event. You remember that? I do. Barb came out there with a, and watched me uh, get hooked up to the tractor. I was here. See, I, I, see, I don't remember. So I might need to get even someday, that's why. <laughs> Another time, uh, and we, yeah, we went up the hydraulics, got her all hooked up to the tractor, but yeah, you can ask Barbara about this. She's probably got some pictures or video or something someplace there on that. Uh, they brought me a 34 field chopper over to the New Fame store, Carstens from Perry's, to demo it at Wade Graff's farm. He was farming on Ward Fenn's farm. On the, the, uh, yeah, not the road, the, uh, Grand Randall. Randall. So he was going to demo it. So they brought it over. Well, it had been demoed a couple times already. They'd run some gravel stones through it, and the knives were kind of nicked up. So they wanted me to touch up the knives and then take it over and demo. So, okay. I hooked it up to the tractor. They brought it over again to pick up. And I put the tractor engine up to 1500 RPM, and it went, Rah! The cutter head just blew up. The knives came out and got into the shear bar. Man. We got checking things over. Somebody at the other store put a thousand RPM PTO shaft on the front of a 540 chopper. So we're running that cutter at just twice as fast as it ought to run to sharpen the knives. So we were a couple of days late getting that out to the demo and put all new knives in a new shear bar. Another time I had a 38 chopper right at the shop in front of the door, an old worn out one, we rented it to somebody. I'm sharpening the knives, and the knife sharpener, you had a crank on it to move it down. Well, all of a sudden, that knife sharpener started going down into the knives. Oh, man. I grabbed all the crank and tried cranking it up, and it's just going harder into the knives. So I headed for the tractor to get it shut down, but it was too late. That whole knife sharpener went right down into the knives. So that took off a set of knives, plus the knife sharpener. But those are the kind of things that happen. Do you folks know what an Irish seven course meal is? It's a sack of potato. <laughs> <laughs> now, for you ladies, definition of a husband. That's a guy who can sit on the creek bank for three hours waiting for a fish to bite, but he can't wait 12 minutes for you guys to get dressed and go off and eat. <laughs> now, this is a good one. Roy, you're going to love this one. One time I went up to a customer, Millville, I might as well use the name. 
Uh, <laughs> the torch off a bearing under a night in the the side conveyor that shot it off. Middle of winter, of course, but it was under nice heat of chop. And it didn't smell very good. It had it in there overnight so it wouldn't freeze and all that. And uh, this shop always has a gas grill sitting in there, too. Sometimes even two. Uh, so anyway, we're torching away, I'm torching away, burning bearings off of this thing, putting new bearings on the our sweater. About that time, my uh, Norton Rickard comes over with some homemade moose and bear burgers or whatever. And then uh, Matt, Matt's the chef, Dave's son Matt, he's, they're starting to cook burgers. I'm cooking them on our sweater with the tarts. <laughs> now, I'll tell you what, you haven't lived until you've been in the same room with a juicy manure sweater being cooked with a torch and eating burgers. <laughs> Us farmers are a different breed of cat. We can do that. <laughs> now over to carrots. Murph and I were checking the combine out, getting it ready for harvest in the springtime, June, end of June. And uh, we'd gotten it done on the ground. I climbed up in the engine compartment. And I hollered him up. I said, hey, you better get up there. So he climbed up there. He said, what's the matter? I said, look at there. There was a petrified raccoon wedged in between the radiator fan and the radiator. Well, that's only about that much room. And the belts broke. I said, man, look at that. And it was just stuff as a So he says, how are we going to get that out of there? Well, we talked on it. You couldn't move it. And uh, apparently, it had been up in there when they started up sometime in the winter and backed it out of the barn and rolled out a load of hay. And uh, good thing they didn't drive it over from town line road. They would cook the engine and go fend it all on it. So anyway, I finally decided we can try a hacksaw. In the end, we took hacksaw blades and broke them in half and put them in the waste grips. He saw it on one end, I saw it on the other end. We each got a half. We finally got a half of right through it. So, everything you're not going to read in the service of the tech manual. It ain't going to happen. Uh, Ole and Lena, you've heard all the Lena jokes. They were always arguing. So every time they're arguing, my Lena, she just kind of turn around and walk away, go in the bathroom and clean the toilet. And Ole says, what's with that anyway? Every time we argue, you walk away from me and go in and clean the toilet. How does that make you feel any better? She says, because I'm using your toothbrush. <laughs> <laughs> I like to tell stories. In conclusion, <laughs> I have to say that it's been interesting working for all you guys and the ones that aren't here over all these years. And I wouldn't change too much. Maybe have some warmer days to work on combines in the winter outside. And uh, I've worked with four generations of people on the Mill Mill farm, and I've worked with four generations on the McCollum farm. Uh, so I've been around a while. For the most part, all of us have been, they've all been great people. Uh, to work for, and they treated me well. And uh, there's a few characters out there, but even that was interesting, because I can hold my own with them too. So, uh, so that I, I like to say to you farmers that I work for, lawn and garden people, thank you very much. Some other year I could have more. That's the best presentation <laughs> you've ever heard. I think I need that. Well, when are you going to write your book? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've had people suggest that, but I can write a book. Yeah, right there. Put it together. That'll take a lot more than that. There's been so many things that happened there. I mean, you could just pick on one or two farms. There's been enough things that happened at just one or two farms. And, uh, so anyway, look at uh, one of your combines. You and I were drilling holes to put pot rivets in the bottom of the grain tank in the middle of winter because the grain was leaking out. And using an air drill, and my drill kept freezing up because it's cold out. And I didn't have any alcohol in the air compressor. <laughs> you know, like I said, we we're always making ice cream out of fly crap. You know? yeah. But we got it done. We got it done. October 30th.